In this class we're going to provide an oversight into employment legislation in the UK. Employment law was introduced for two reasons. First of all it promotes a better working relationship between employers and employees. The ground rules have been set out by law. So both employees and employers know their rights and their obligations. So it clarifies the agreement between employers and employees. And it also brings equality to the workplace. It tries to uh, introduce fairness into employment to give candidates a fair chance of being selected for jobs. Now the types of legislation, well there are many. In fact there's a list of ten different laws. Uh, we'll go through some of these in the course of this session but not in great detail just to talk generally about them but you can see from the ten that they cover many aspects of work and employers should be aware of this and that's, this is why a good human resource department is so important. The human resource department should be should have a, an expertise in this area and should know what the rules are and the regulations and be able to apply these throughout the, uh, the working environment of the business. So let's have a look at some of them in, in little more detail just to see what what's meant. Start with the uh, Sex Discrimination Act in 1975. This makes it unlawful to discriminate uh, on the grounds of sex and marital status. So an employer could not advertise a vacancy and disqualify um, perhaps men or women from applying on the basis of their gender. So you can't say this job is only suitable for men. Um, it should be open. And the selection process should make it clear the requirements of the job and enable applicants to almost self-select. They, they think if they're suitable for the, that particular task then they can apply. It does not rule them out from the start. Simply being a certain gender does not disqualify somebody from applying for um, for a job. Likewise, if they're married, it should not preclude them from uh, applying for jobs. Um, if they're married or unmarried, it doesn't matter. What is important is, can the people who are applying do the job that's advertised? Can they perform the tasks that's required in that position? Men and women must be treated equally in the workplace. So it also applies to recruitment, promotion, training and sex sexual harassment. So the Sex Discrimination Act covers a wide range of activities within the business from recruitment, promoting, um, so promotion for example within the organization should not be based on gender. It should be based on who is best suited, which could be a male or a female, training, sexual harassment, similar things. There are two forms of discrimination that can be identified in this context, direct and indirect. Direct discrimination is when discrimination is evident. If the employer comes out and says only men can apply for this particular task or only men can uh, uh, can have this promotion. That's clear. That's clear discrimination. Um, what is required here is for the employer to specify the tasks, the duties, the obligations, the responsibilities that go with a certain position and then leave it open to whoever wants to apply, male or female. A person is 
treated less favorably than another in the same circumstances. For example, let's say men and women performing the same task, performing exactly the same task, but men get paid more. Well, there's no logic for that. They're performing exactly the same task. And in a lot of jobs, that is the case. Um, so there is no reason for one gender to be paid more than another, simply because of gender. It's who can do the job best that should rule the roost. That's the, the, the basis upon which the decision should be made. Women may be treated unfairly due to maternity leave or sickness due to pregnancy. So there has to be some sort of compassion within the business. The employers have to realise that um, we need a future generation, we need children, we need babies to be born. And women who leave for maternity should be treated fairly. Likewise, when they return from maternity, they have obligations outside of the workplace. So some flexibility could be given to those people to look after their families and make sure that their families are secure and uh, developing in, a, in a, a natural way and that the children are not being, the children are being cared for, they're not being neglected. So some sort of fairness in employment is, is what's aimed at. Examples of direct discrimination say a female applicant applies for a promotion even though she lacks sufficient skills and experience compared to a male um, applicant. So if, if she lacks the skills then there may be a case for not having but let's say let's just reverse that one slightly and say she had the skills or she has the skills. If she has the skills which are identical to the male then there is no basis for rejecting her. The discriminator in that case will have to be something else. It will have to be the quality of her work. So it's important to be as objective as possible. If she lacks the skills there may be grounds for rejecting her. But if she has the same skills then they must go through a process to see which candidate was best or is best to perform that particular task. As I said earlier, there may be unfair treatment of women who have returned to work after maternity leave. It is simply unfair to, to treat women badly or ask them to, uh, to work extra shifts or to um, take work home in the evening and perform additional duties if they've already got the burden of a newborn child. It just seems unfair and the law is attempting to redress that. It's recognising the importance that families are in our community and trying to ensure <coughs> that the the family structure is not damaged because people have to work, they have to earn a living. Um, females may not be respected in male dominated work environments and vice versa. Males may not be respected in female dominated work environments. Um, they may be the subject of jokes in the office or um, uh, bad remarks. They may not be respected. So it's important that the the law supports people, that it does not become oppressive and uh, lead to uh, people having to leave employment uh, simply because they couldn't tolerate what was happening around them. Indirect discrimination, well when it's present but it's not obvious. Indirect discrimination is, is when there's discrimination present but it's difficult to detect it. For example, uh, the introduction of a condition which may disadvantage one sex. So 
some condition of employment that uh, workers are expected to work until 6 every evening and work on Saturdays until 1 o'clock or whatever. Some rule, some new rule that males could fit in with easily but females would find difficult because of their home circumstances. That's indirect discrimination. Or it could be indirect discrimination because of a reorganization in the business and um, they have to work in, in a different part of the plant which is um, noisy and, and not, not conducive to getting on with their work. If, if it's an office task and they're suddenly in, in a, an environment which is noisy and polluted and so on, uh, it's, indirect, it's, it's putting pressure on them to leave. It's an ind indirect form of discrimination. And again, as I said, the, the law is attempting to redress that. Victimization. Um, victimization is also covered in the Act. <coughs> the Act makes it unlawful for an employer to victimize an employee due uh, to um, a, di a discrimination claim. So if somebody brings a claim against the employer for some unfairness under the Act, and let's say it wins, then the employer cannot victimize that person later. The employer cannot uh, pick out that person for harsh treatment later on, or try to find ways of punishing the person for bringing the, the claim under the Sex Discrimination Act in the first place. So that is victimization, and that's also covered. The employer can't do that. There may be instances where an employer has not taken action against uh, discrimination due to the fear of being victimized. An employee, I should say, has not taken action because they're afraid of being victimized. Well, the law tries to protect them. So if, if they are suffering at work because of their gender, they can bring an action under the Sex Discrimination Act, and if they win, then they can't be victimized later. They can't be got at later on by the employer. Now the types of remedies that are available, well, declaration outlines the rights of the victim and explains the, right, the rights of the employer employees involved. So that's one way in which issues can be resolved, by simply making it clear to both sides the implications of going down this road, going down the road of taking legal action. Then that may be enough to, to stop the situation from arising. There may be compensation if it goes to law. Um, it could be a cash sum awarded to the victim for any financial loss or emotional distress due to the effects of discrimination. So if a person is feeling bad and, and perhaps uh, under stress because of what's happening at work because of his or her gender, then that person may qualify for compensation and may be awarded a sum of money to redress, to put right the stress that they feel. Recommendation, well, methods to prevent the incident from recurring. For example, providing additional training for equal opportunities. It could be that the, the court ask the employer to uh, attend courses on how to, to manage staff and not discriminate in this way or, or have additional training for all the staff in the company. Perhaps an outside agency is brought in to talk to people about the, the problem of sex discrimination at work. There's also the Race Relations Act. Uh, this is the Act of 1976. This, this was um, updated, I think, in 2000. The Race Relations Act of 76, now, now reformed as the uh, Race Relations Act 2000. Um, the Act makes it unlawful to discriminate on the grounds of race, colour, nationality, ethnic origins and religious beliefs. Well, 
in terms of business, if we think about this, none of these issues, none of these characteristics are important in terms of business. It's the ability of the person to perform the task, to, to perform the task efficiently. That's what we've been talking about through all of the lectures. It's selecting the right staff to work in a team, to cooperate, to be innovative, to be efficient. That's what we've been talking about. And the colour of a person's skin does not influence that, or the nationality, or the ethnic origins, or the religious beliefs, providing they can work effectively and be efficient. That's the, the core requirement. So the law steps in to ensure that these other issues are not taken into account in employment and that people who work for businesses are not discriminated on the basis of their race or colour or nationality or, or whatever. This Act applies in areas of employment, education, planning, housing and public services. Um, it's almost sad that such an Act is required but it is because uh, people wrongly take these into account perhaps in, in employment. So the Act stops employers from looking at people's religious beliefs or their nationality or whatever. It's their ability to perform the task that's important. It's their ability to work in the team, to make constructive comments about work, to make suggestions, to be innovative, to be good timekeepers, to be diligent, to have good quality work. These are the important issues. Now direct discrimination. Well this type of discrimination occurs when it's made evident that an individual has been discriminated on the basis of colour, race, nationality or ethnic origin. It's when it's explicit. It's, it's when somebody says it out loud and, and makes it clear that the person is not getting the job because of his or her colour or race or whatever. That is direct discrimination. For example, an employer may refuse an applicant uh, an application form because the candidate is not the right colour. Um, it has happened. It has happened all too often. So the law steps in and stops employers making that decision. It's important, as I keep saying, that the person is selected on business criteria, on their suitability to do the job, not on these other issues, colour, race, um, religious belief and so on. Indirect discrimination, it's more insidious, but this type of discrimination is, as it suggests, indirect. An individual may be discriminated on the grounds of colour, race and nationality, but the, event, in the, in, the individual may not be made aware of the discrimination. So it's more insidious, it's, it's still utterly wrong, but the person's discriminated against, but they don't know, they don't feel that they are, but they are. They're being discriminated against. Uh, it's just not explicit. It's difficult to prove as a consequence. It could be, for example, the introduc introduction of a dress code at work without taking into consideration the employee's culture or religious beliefs. Now that would be banned under, under the law. Um, but it can be all sorts of indirect discrimination. As I said, the, this particular law was amended in 2000 and it came into force in 2001. The law acknowledges the promotion of racial equality and stresses the importance of race equality within the public authorities. Um, I keep saying it and I, I've said it so many times in the course of this session so far the important characteristic we must bear in mind is the ability to do the task. It's the ability 
to perform the function. That's what's important. Somebody's colour, race, religious beliefs, dress code, these things are not that important. They're not important at all. So it's the ability to do the job that's important. Race equality must be implemented within the workplace, recruitment, training, promotion and dismissal. So racial equality <coughs> should cut across all aspects of recruitment, of the day-to-day -day running of the business, training, to make sure that the employees receive the same training, they're not discriminated against on the basis of religious beliefs or whatever, that promotion should be fair and should be open to all who have the right skills and the right backgrounds, the right aptitudes. And there's also the Equal Pay Act. Equal Pay Act is enforced to ensure that men and women are entitled to equal pay for taking part in similar jobs. I said this at the outset. <clears throat> it's quite strange that sometimes uh, employers would want to pay let's say men more for doing exactly the same job as women. There's no logic in that at all. But uh, a law had to be passed in 1970 to try and ensure that this was not the case. Employers are required by law to provide equal opportunities to both men and women in terms of their employment contract. So the same opportunities should go to men and women. And if they're doing exactly the same job, they should get equal pay. If they're equally efficient, apply themselves equally. And with the introduction of widespread technology in business, many tasks that previously required uh, <coughs> muscle and brawn to undertake are now undertake, undertaken by machines which are driven by pressing buttons and pulling levers. So women can equally do the function. Therefore, surely equal pay should, pro should prevail. The Equal Pay Act will be enforced if uh, like work is, uh, is done by both parties. If the work is the same, they should have equal pay. And the work is of equal value for both men and women. Um, job is equivalent under the job evaluation scheme. If the jobs are the same, or is judged to be the same, then they should be equally paid. Simply paying some workers more than others for doing the same job does not make sense. If both are equally efficient and both apply themselves with dexterity and good application to the job, then they should have the same rate of pay. How to make a claim? In order to make a claim it's vital that the claimant provides the following details. A comparator uh, who is of the opposite sex working in the same employment under the same employment contract. So if, uh, if a lady is taking an action under, uh, under this law then she should find a worker, let's say a male worker, who is doing exactly the same job as her but who is getting more. If it's exactly the same tasks, the same output, the same skills are required, the same conditions of work apply. If everything's the same, then it should be the same rate of pay. The comparator and the claimant must be employed at the same time or at some point within six years. So under this law, the, compar the comparator um, this applies over a six-year period. In other words, uh, a woman today undertaking the task could look at what was happening in the past 
and how long has this gone on? How long has there been a discrepancy in the pay? And if it's over a six year period, they can claim for that period. So over six years, so they will be owed the difference if they're found to be right in taking the action. Like work, well, an employee can claim under like work if the employee is undertaking the same amount of work load as their competitor. Well, I shouldn't say competitor, but in this sense they, they are competitors in the sense that they are um, they're struggling to uh, impress the employer for higher wages and maintain their working conditions. So the male does not want to be downgraded as a consequence of the female action in bringing, uh, bringing an action in law. So, um, but if the employees are doing the same work, then uh, or doing like work, then they should get the same rate of pay. Tribunals will look at the job description and the employee contract of work to evaluate duties and inequalities of pay. So it'll go to tribunals which are like industrial courts and it will be assessed in that forum as to whether um, equal pay should be should be paid. But it should be based on like work. If they're doing like work it should be the same. Job evaluation scheme. Well the job evaluation scheme is a process carried out by the employer. The aim is to measure the claimant and comparator, the comparator's efforts, skills and decision making based on their job. So job evaluation is trying to look at the different tasks within the business to ensure that the employees are being treated fairly. Looking at who is comparable to who in terms of the tasks that they perform, the skills with which they perform them, their their abilities, their their work rate. Looking at all of those, are they getting the same rate of pay? So job evaluation should bring out any inequality or any unfairness that can be uh, looked at by the employer and fixed by the employer. Now work of equal value. The work of equal value occurs when job evaluation schemes cannot be conducted. Sometimes it's it's difficult to work out exactly what people are doing. Um, sometimes tasks are somewhat confused. Somebody is doing a particular task but they're also undertaking a separate task as well. So and the other person may be doing the same task but taking on a different task as well as that. So it's not always easy to get comparability. So um, equal value uh, of work it may be um, the basis for any action. The tribunal has the task of evaluating the claimants and comparators jobs and deciding whether the jobs are of equal value. If they are of equal value then they should be the same rate of pay. But sometimes the jobs are not, if you like, physically the same. They're not identical. Perhaps uh, the male is doing something else, uh, perhaps running the machine and getting the raw materials to feed into the machine, whereas the female worker is using the same machine but taking away the finished product to be packaged somewhere else. So they're not identical jobs, but if they're equal value, they should have the same rate of pay. The tribunal would evaluate the two jobs and try to work out what is fair. It's similar to a job evaluation scheme. It's similar to an employer undertaking the task of trying to match up who's doing what and how similar are the tasks. Now the types of compensation available. If a claimant is successful, 
an equal clause must be inserted into their contracts of employment. So the, the problem must be corrected and their contract of employment must be amended so that they are treated fairly in future. So the contracts of employment must be changed. And back payment from the date of lodging a claim to the date the, the clause was embedded in the contract. So they should be back dated uh, if this discrimination, if that's what it was, was held to be the case uh, by the tribunal, then the, the claimant should be compensated right back to the start. Because that is money due to the claimant. That's what should have been paid from the start and was not paid. Now there's Disability Claimant Act. Um, come into effect in uh, 1995. This act makes it unlawful to discriminate uh, people who have a disability. So it's important that they have an opportunity to participate in the workforce, the same as everyone else. In fact, modern ways of working using computers and using um, modern communication techniques means that uh, disabled people are able to effectively participate in the labour market. Uh, able-bodied people sitting at computers, sitting at desks for hours at end, on end, um, doing a particular task, that same task could be performed by many disabled people sitting at the same desk performing the same task. So modern technology is enabling the disabled to find work more easily. And it's important that they're not discriminated against or put off because of their disability. The law is effective in the recruitment process in land and property and goods and services. So a landlord, for example, cannot refuse to have uh, a person as a tenant because of a disability. Um, they should be able to buy property uh, irrespective of disability and so on. Goods and services have to be suitable for, uh, for use for the disabled. But in the recruitment process, which is the one we're focusing on here, then individuals should not be discriminated against on the basis of disability. It really comes back to what I've been saying right throughout. It's their ability to perform the task that's required. If they can perform that, then they should not be discriminated against. People with disabilities have important rights of access to everyday services. Um, they should not be put off from participating fully in the business community or in the community at large. So they have um, rights to access many different areas and it's the onus on the, the business person running those areas is to ensure that people with disabilities have got access. So it's not just recruitment but it's the, the whole range of services that have been offered. The Employment Act 1995, <coughs> as I said, came into effect in um, that year. So we can't, dis uh, we as the business community, cannot discriminate against people on the basis of disability, the same as they can't discriminate on the basis of gender. Um, and it shouldn't be based on age either. It's the ability to complete the task that's important. Um, the Act was later uh, amended in 2001 to, uh, by the Special Education and Disability Act. The Disability Discrimination Act, well this Act defines a person with a disability, a person who has a mental or physical impairment. This impairment affects their ability to carry out normal daily activities. But 
within that, if a person can perform the task in a business, perhaps working on a computer, or doing accounts, or processing data, or is able to undertake many activities um, because of the advent of um, technology, then the person should have the right to apply for those jobs and should be considered seriously against able-bodied people for those positions. It's their ability to perform the task that should be borne in mind. The Disability Act, well the employer, uh, it's unlawful to discriminate uh, against any employee or job candidate on the grounds of disability. So simply because somebody is disabled doesn't mean that they should not be employed. It's their ability to perform the task, do the job that's advertised. That's the important part. And discrimination should not occur during recruitment or redundancy or dismissal. If the company is facing redundancies because it has to wind down, because the market has turned down, then disabled people working for the company should not be let go first. That's wrong. It's, it needs to be more rational. It needs to, uh, the company needs to look at parts of the business that can, can be toned down, can be run down obviously with the view of avoiding redundancy if at all possible but if redundancies have to take place they should take place in the areas that can go not simply looking at personnel based on their uh, ability or their disability the employer must ensure that discrimination does not occur within the workplace so someone with a disability should not be discriminated against and should not be uh, joked about or teased or bullied or abused at work. The environment at work should be, um, should be a happy environment in which people go to work to perform the tasks to earn a living and to live their lives. People do not go to work to be abused or discriminated against. The employer has the right to make necessary adjustments to accommodate people who have uh, a disability. So the employer can change around the organization and um, can uh, reorder the, the, the business perhaps in line with the employment of people with disabilities. But the, the single thing to bear in mind right throughout this session is the person's capacity to perform the task that's required. If they have the capacity to perform the task, that's all that's needed. And they should be judged on that and that alone. So people should not be judged on the basis of their colour, their creed, their dress code, their disability or their gender. It's their ability to perform the task. It's their ability to work in a team, to be innovative, to be creative, to uh, be efficient, to be reliable, to have good quality work. These are the essential attributes for business and people should be judged on those and those alone, not on their appearance, their disabilities, or their dress code, or whatever. It's, these are not relevant. So that's a review of some of the law in this area uh, of employment legislation in the UK. There are many other laws that have uh, been passed that we're not dealing with, uh, which perhaps we should get a mention but we have limited time and limited scope. So these are the important ones, the, the main acts. Um, all of them simply add up to treating people fairly. That's what it bubbles down to. Treating people fairly and honestly. Um, that's all I'm going to do 
in this session so I'm going to leave it at that say thank you for watching